Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation here in far north Thailand at the Anantara Golden Triangle. Um, due to some Wi-Fi issues, I am in back in a, in a slightly unusual place. I'm not up in the bar anymore. Um, when I usually <laughs> hang out, I am here in the office, um, and I am pleased to bring you a second a second presentation by uh, our elephant osteopath, uh, Dr. Tony Nevin. Um, we will have some live demonstration with uh, Dr. Nisa later on with an elephant and or Dr. Nisa and Pumpui. So it's going to be a fun one, this one. This is the second time Tony has spoken for us. And uh, yes, I'm just checking to make sure we're live. It doesn't say that we're going live. Hold on a second. Okay. We know we're going live. Okay, good. <laughs> Normal signs aren't here. I'm sorry, a bit confused now because we've had trouble finding Wi-Fi, but now we have Wi-Fi. We are ready to go. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Tony before the Wi-Fi drops out again. That's the best thing to do. Uh, thank you very much for joining, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us, Tony. Um, you can tell us all about what we've done because uh, because I'm sure you're going to anyway. <laughs> Pleasure to see you again. Tony, over to you. Pleasure to see you. And thank you so much for inviting me back. I feel very honoured. Um, and uh, yes, I only wish this was out there in person, but this is as close as we can get at the moment. Um, for those of you who haven't seen any of the work that John and I have been doing for the last um, decade or more, um, we have been working with elephants that effectively have been rehabilitated from either the um, logging industry and or the tourist industry. And the idea is to get elephants uh, that have that cannot be returned to the wild um, as close to as possible in as nice an environment as possible um, doing what they should be doing but open for tourists to actually see and effectively the, the elephants become ambassadors. Now these elephants come with their own problems and some of them are physical, some of them are emotional and some are a mix of both. And I've been working with elephants now for about 30 years. Um, and it all started, if we can get this to work, why is my screen not changing the slides? Here we go. Um, it all started um, many, many, many years ago, back in the UK with this 11 year old Asian elephant uh, from Myanmar. And uh, she was one of two that were brought over to the UK to Twycross Zoo. And whilst at Twycross Zoo, the, they, were, they had an older female elephant there. These were all fe this was an all-female group. And unfortunately, the older female decided to discipline the younger two, which is not uncommon. And she ended up with... Um, a shoulder problem that altered the way she moved and ended up meaning that actually her back end was moving differently as well. And you'll hear me talking about movement patterns and you'll see it when we do the live demonstration that I'll talk about movement patterns and the fact that you can't just home in and treat one little bit. You need to treat the whole elephant in order to fully appreciate what, what it is that we're trying to achieve. Um, before I go any further, a little bit of background is that osteopathy is about 120, 130 years old. It is what is classed as a manual form of medicine in that we use our hands to apply changes to the musculoskeletal system. And it is musculoskeletal. We don't treat bones. We're treating the function of the body framework, which is made up of um, the, the skin, the connective tissue, such as fascia, muscles, tendons, ligaments, joint capsules, which are sort of extensions of ligaments, and um, the skeletal structure so that the sort of the framework of the body but we alter the framework of the body by tweaking the soft tissues um, any of you that have had to suffer my lectures before will know that I talk a lot about um, the body being similar to a tent with all the guy ropes and what we spend most of our time doing is tweaking the tension on the guy ropes in order to affect the structure of the tent or the body 
Um, you will also hear terms like holistic, and a lot of people think sandals, long hair, big beard when they hear holistic. But really, what holistic means is you're you're looking at the the entire patient as a unit, as a whole. And when I'm looking at elephants, everything I'm looking at and trying to achieve is to alter the effect to the whole elephant, and obviously to alter it beneficially. Um, so as I say, she she ended up with a left shoulder problem. This is Mimbu, um, but it transposed that that also affected the right hip. So with um, with us, we're called bipeds, um, yeah. apart from Friday nights when a lot of people revert to being quadrupeds after um, drinking too much. And we walk up on two legs and in order to move, when we move one leg forward, our alternate shoulder um, will swing as well. Now, if you turn that down to a quadruped that, that stands on four legs, when they're moving, there should be an element of this, of a diagonal effect going on so that um, if they're trying to take weight off one limb, they will load another one. So they'll load the other end of the diagonal and this is effectively what had happened with Mimbu you know left hip left shoulder right hip and uh, there was no there was no textbook there was no there was nothing to help me to treat this elephant I had to work out what to do and it took me about six months in order to find out a what she would let me do and b what was beneficial and see the frequency that we were to treat her that we would get a good response um, because if you, it's very easy with um, doing any manual work you can overstimulate the nerve supply um, to the muscles and the soft tissues and that all feeds back it's like um, streams feeding into rivers and that river is in in the body is the central nervous system and it's very easy to overload the central nervous system. And especially with patients that are not used to being massively handled or touched. Um, so when you think, if you think about somebody who's really ticklish, you imagine tickling them for continuously or for long periods, you're going to oversensitize um, their system initially. They would eventually get used to it. But with treatment, it is so easy to overtreat. And so it took me a good six months to, to work out what we could do and what, what would work and what wouldn't work. And eventually we got to a point where um, it was clear that she enjoyed the treatments. She enjoyed them partly because of what was happening, but partly also because um, we made sure she was fed whilst she was being treated. And that's something I've continued on with um, pretty much every species I work with, unless it's obviously anaesthetised. Um, but all of the ones that are actively awake and we're working with, which includes 99.9% .9 of the elephants that I've treated, um, we feed them so it's a positive reinforcement when we're when we're doing this type of work um now i should add that she was in good health other other than the the, the physical aspect of her and um, psychologically she was um, a really well balanced elephant um so one of the big questions I always get is how do you treat them? And I entitled that the or well, the subtitle to this lecture today was achieving the impossible. Because when I started to look around to see if I could get advice on how to, to um, treat elephants, everybody that I came across just said, it's not possible, they're too big. You're not going to be able to achieve anything. You're not going to be able to change anything. And of course, you know, we now know that that isn't true. But that was sort of a glass ceiling that we as therapists and as a profession had set ourselves. And I like, I do like challenges. Um, but I'm also realistic. Um, it's obvious that somebody my size is not going to be able to physically manipulate them in the same way as when we're treating a person or a dog. Um, so I needed to think outside the box and I needed to work out how could I get physiological changes, so changes at a cellular level 
to the health of the tissues and the and to change the resting state of um, tissues because that, that's the key to to uh, osteopathy is by changing the resting state of the tissues we can then affect um, the ability to move correctly and to move freely and then it's a case of um, the, the patient either relearning how to move or being encouraged to move correctly and that's what I set about doing and a lot of the osteopathic techniques were taught at college actually transposed really easily onto the elephant the toughest bit was getting over the fact that you've got a, a much larger canvas to work with than we're used to um, but once I got beyond that once I, I sort of found um, uh, sort of charts of anatomy and that of the elephant spoken at length with the keepers and anyone who had knowledge of, of the elephants and, and the vets that were involved it became apparent that, that in theory I should be able to do it so if, if in theory I could then in my mind I would and so I just started and I started working through the various muscle chains so that if you, if you look at the, um, the anatomy of any um, mammal if you peel off the skin the muscles are all very very similar um, some of them have slightly different names and there are a few variations but 90 plus percent of the muscles are going to be the same in a human as they are in an elephant they just have different functions uh, we'll leave out the trunk because that's that's um, a different entity and has a, a mass of muscles um, and there was a fantastic lecture last week on on the trunk of the elephant and if you haven't watched it please do because it was absolutely amazing um, I decided to to break it down into that and work through these these muscle chains as we call them because all the muscles are interconnected they're interconnected with um, the fascia and, um, and often muscle fibers often you when you're dissecting um, uh, doing dissection you'll look at a muscle and you'll think well this all looks like the same thing but it's often given three or four different names depending where it is in the body so if it's a long muscle along the, the, the spine it will often have it will often have sort of sub names for the section of the spine it's in but of course when we're learning these things we often think of them as separate entities when in fact it's a little bit like driving along a motorway and you're in suddenly in one county and then in another um, but actually you're still on the same bit of motorway um, and so so with Mimbu I had to learn on the job I had to find out what was possible and you'll notice uh, now she's kneeling down and the first thing I learned was not to stand on a step ladder um, because um, elephants have trunks and they're very inquisitive and very soon the step ladder moved and so did I um, so then I thought it's probably safer if I treat her whilst I'm on the ground um, and working out what did and didn't work now with some species of animals the tail can be really useful um, as a tool for applying gentle traction because if you look along her spine the tail is an extension of the spine and so you've got connections with all the ligaments joint capsules and that and it's a little bit like gently gapping um, a railway train and all the carriages so that's pretty much how all the vertebral joints intervertebral joints are um, you've got all of these carriages or vertebrae that if we gently traction we can we can change the resting state of those tissues and the, the feedback from the stretch receptors in each of those joints we can alter and there are certain species you can do this with comfortably cattle are not one a cattle their tails uh, fracture and, and um, you can damage the integrity of the joints very easily so we tend not to pull on cows tails um, dogs horses and elephants absolutely fine and my weight on an elephant's tail is nothing like um, the pull from another elephant on their tail which you, you'll sometimes see and you'll, you'll sometimes see youngsters holding them their mother's tail as they walk along um, so I soon learnt that I could get into um, affecting change along the spine and therefore the nerve the little nerves that come out from the spine supplying the muscles but also supplying the other organs of the of the body 
So by working on this external structure of the animal, you can very often affect um, things like the lungs, the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the, the digestive tract, and just get it reset back to a normal setting. And, uh, and so this is what I started to do. I looked at the various things I could do and what worked and what didn't work. And then in this slide, I'm using my body weight to actually rock and just push against her while she was sidelined. Now with elephants, we don't really like them laying down on a hard surface for too long, um, partly because um, they're closely related to whales and they don't have a pleura, which means they don't have a membrane between the uh, musculature of the rib cage and the lungs. And so we, we just don't really want too much pressure there because they haven't got the cushioning that you normally get um, when um, laying on your side or, or moving against a, a hard surface. And then I then started applying deeper techniques to specific areas. So once I got the general articulation going and movement and it was building up a rhythm that her tissues would and body liked and if they don't like it they'll, they'll just get up so um, as simple as that they, they, they won't tolerate you doing something they don't like and the keeper in the far at the front is um, just drip feeding food um, to her um, one of the things we soon found was as they do relax um, they'll often relax their um, pelvic floor and so you often get a blast of um, of gas um, which can be quite forceful actually in a confined area um, so yes one of, one of the downsides to treating a large vegetarian is that they, they produce a lot of gas um, so yes we soon found out that and that again created amusement and, and that tends to any amusement when you're working with elephants tends to bind the team together and that's what it's all about it's all about the the teamwork and in the background you can see the various keepers and that and it's always important to get people on board understanding what it is you're doing because i'm only there for a short period of time and then we want the work to continue so with Mimbu, what did we achieve? Well, um, from extensive research, we're pretty certain she was the first known osteopathic um, uh, candidate um, um, and successful uh, treatment. Um, she responded well and, and actually interacted with me um, in a positive way. Um, not every elephant does, and John can give you stories of some where they, they don't always want to. Um, but she was a massive, massive um, classroom for myself. I, I, she allowed me to learn from her. And this is so important. And I would say there isn't a single patient I haven't learned something from. But with her, it was a very steep learning curve um, and absolutely fantastic. And I was able to gain the trust and support from the zoo staff. And this, again, was essential. Now, a lot of people have issues with zoos. If I hadn't been able to treat Mimbu at this zoo and other zoos that I've worked in, the work I've done out in the field would have been infinitely harder. Um, and zoo animals are great ambassadors. They do get children. They do get people from inner cities and that to understand that these these creatures are living entities they are sentient beings and this is essential to getting people on board and hence probably most of you that are watching this you know hopefully you'll have a better understanding of elephants and 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 be more amazed by them than than you already are um, but we also found that the treatment needed to be continued regularly when i was working with them um, and that was but that was tough at first to get by the zoo staff because obviously when people are skeptical they think uh, oh yeah you're just trying to drum up work um but it wasn't a case of that what we found was that it took quite a while to for her body to learn the new normal um and it's a little bit like learning a language or learning to ride a bike or anything new you need to continue practicing in order to get it. And then you get to a certain point where actually, yes, you, you've got muscle memory and everything, and actually you can continue quite easily. 
Um, the other great thing with this was that she was 11 when I started the treatment. By the time she was um, just before she was about 14 years old, she was successfully mated, um, natural mating with a, with a large bull elephant at Chester Zoo. She went full term and she reared her calf herself. Now, at the time, we're going back into the um, late 80s, early 90s. Um, I think it was the early 1990s when she was mated. Um, she was rare in the in the UK and Europe in the first time round, she seemed to know what to do. But she was also the, the, the keepers at Chester Zoo reported that when she was mated, she had no problems taking the weight of the bull. And then when she um, she successfully reared this calf and um, it was just absolutely fantastic to see. Now, I don't think with the way her movement problems were, A, she would have taken the weight of the bull very easily. And because there was um, irritation in her lumbar spine, that would have affected the nerve supply to her reproductive organs. And there's a higher probability that she might not have, have carried the calf to full term. And when, by full term, we're talking sort of 22 plus months. Um, so their, their gestation period is, is a lot longer than the human one. Now, if we swing forward a couple of decades, um, we're, we're out in the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation. Um, and uh, here I was, if you can see, hopefully it'll come through clearly enough on your screen, but you'll see on the tarmac, we marked out one meter um, lines. And, uh, and then we started filming some of the elephants at the, at the foundation, um, their stride length pre and post osteopathy treatment and this was during one of my workshop trips where I took other professionals out there and we basically would spend five or six days treating the elephants and then reassess them on the last day and one of the other other benefits of putting these lines and having a camera there was that the traffic coming to the to and from the hotel slowed down because they thought it was a speed trap um, and an awful lot of what we do when we're when we're doing anything with elephants or, or any patient is observation. Now, observation is key, and most physical practitioners, so manual therapists, whether they're osteopaths, chiropractors, or physiotherapists, want to get their hands on their patients. But the most important bit is standing back and observing them, and no more so than with elephants. Now, with elephants, if you stand close to them, they want to interact with you. So it's always best to stand back a reasonable distance to observe what they're doing, how they stand, how they carry themselves, whether they favour one side more than the other, whether they're comfortable um, either with another elephant or a, or a person or something on one side more than the other. All of these things build up a, a little picture of what it's probably going to be like when you get closer and when you get hands on and uh, one of the other tools I sometimes use and it's a lot harder to use this in the far east I have taken a smaller unit out there um, this is one I use in the UK and this particular elephant is the oldest elephant um, in Europe uh, she's Anne and she's at Longleat um, I was with her yesterday, um, so it's been quite a nice elephant week. Um, but she's sort of in her 60s and still going pretty strong, but she is arthritic, and so I'm doing a lot of work with her. But we use a high-definition infrared thermal imaging camera, so that's what H-D-I-R-T-I -I stands for, high-definition infrared thermal imaging. And what that does is it reads the radiated temperature coming off um, the, the, the body but you do have to use it under strict control so you need the camera at 90 degrees to the, to the subject and you need um, to be away from any drafts heat sources um, humidity and that's always a big problem in in northern thailand um, or any pretty much most of thailand and southeast asia um, but you you want you want to sort of use the camera under controls like that so you don't want the elephant to have been stood out in the sun they walk into the elephant house and then you thermal image because you're going to get a false reading and um, you'll notice her ears are very cold so that the blue is the coldest if you look at the scale um, down the 
the side of the um, um, of the picture. Um, the 20.4 degrees is the coldest and 30.4 is the highest setting. Um, parts of her trunk and legs and uh, just over her, the base of her, root of her tail are off the scale. Um, but what I'm looking for is any difference um, of more than one and a half degrees centigrade to um, to the norm, so to, to the bulk of her body. And what we found with um, thermal imaging thousands of horses is that anything over one and a half degrees centigrade corresponds to um, a difference in the resting state of, of the musculoskeletal system. Now, what this reads is it reads the blood flow under the skin. And the blood flow under the skin corresponds, the nerve supply to that corresponds very closely to the nerve supply to particular muscle groups. So by reading these patterns, we can actually look and see which muscle groups um, have, uh, are either resting at the wrong, wrong state. Now, a tight muscle will reduce the blood flow through it. So you'll actually get a cooler reading. So most of the time, I'm more interested in the cold areas than the hot. Where I am interested in hot areas is if you think you've got a puncture wound or an infection. Um, so increased heat in the feet of an elephant, um, especially one toe um, or one part of the, the, the foot, then we are worried about. Um, I'm not surprised her trunk is nice and hot because she uses it a lot. Um, and also um, her belly, because it's a nice um, sort of insulated area. And she, she, we, we do always have to work at carrying um, her, um, not, not allowing her to carry too much weight. So there's a, there's a picture of her foot. You'll just see there's a slight bit of raised temperature um, around um, the one toe. And that's an area where we, we have to keep an eye on it. Hey, Tony, um, uh, yep. Sorry, uh, we, we, we might lose our elephant uh, for live. So can we take a break? Can we go live now and then come back to the presentation later? Absolutely perfect. Perfect timing, John. Yes, oh, yeah, let's, let's go. Let's go live. So what I can do is I can show you on a real elephant uh, what's okay. going on. So I will remove the pin. You may have to stop sharing and I will pin. OK, I'll stop sharing. Uh... How do I stop sharing? Uh, how do you stop sharing? Uh, Try going to screen share and see if it allows you to do, do hit screen share and, and probably it'll allow you to stop sharing. Has that done it or not? No. No, it not? no it's... Um... Oh, God, sorry about this. Okay. Well, I what I'll do is I will pin. If, if you if you take me off, yeah. Okay. Sorry now now that. I've got now we have Ooh's camera. Brilliant. Right. So Ooh's here good. we. Am I allowed to talk? Yes, please. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> um, here we have Pompui and Dr. Nissa. Um, um now, so, sorry inter interrupt, but I don't think you can do it without stop sharing your screen. Oh, hang on. Here we go. There you go. There you go. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. I found it's all right. I was looking straight at the thing and missed it. Right. Here we have Pompui and Dr. Nessa. Good to see you, Dr. Nessa. Now, first of all, if um, if you can just move the camera back slightly, what we'd do is we'll try and look at Pompui as a whole elephant and look at her stance, look at her load bearing. So we just, we just turn around slightly. There you go. That's brilliant. That's perfect. And if you look at her, just look at the muscling, look at how she moves. Now you will notice that she leans over to one side. And you'll notice that she's very stiff with this right hind leg and that she stands mostly on the left hind. You'll also notice that there's less muscling over the, the right hip um, and thigh musculature. With that, you'll also know that because of that, she'll stand more heavily on her left shoulder. And that's because she's trying to offload um, this 
this um, problem with the, the right hind. Um, now, we know that she had a previous injury. We think um, she was probably hit by a vehicle and there's probably been a fracture somewhere either around the pelvis or the hip joint itself. Um, and we, because of that, and it's an old injury, we're not going to be able to change that as such. But what we can do is try and maximise her ability to um, move as well as possible. So now we've, we've observed her like this. Um, what we do is we get Dr. Nissa, but where I always do is I always go up to, once an elephant knows you're there, the mahout's working with you, we, get, we go up to the shoulder. The shoulder is the safe place to go to. And so we don't walk up behind them. Elephants can't see directly in front or directly behind. And then we just place a nice flat hand on and get, get the elephant used to the touch. And you use a, a nice flat hand and firm pressure. So that's brilliant. And then if you keep your hands on and join with your other hand, Nissa, and uh, use both hands and then just gently push up against her shoulder musculature. And what we do with this is we just encourage the elephant to lean into you. And then you hold that and you can see how the skin is, is um, puckering up. That's because she's leaning back against Dr. <laughs> Nessa. And she's going to lean quite hard. And sometimes we use more than one person to do this. But what this does is it starts to alter the resting state all around that shoulder blade and, and that front limb. And the idea of this is you start to get a change, but you get a change in a place where she's comfortable. So we don't go straight to the areas where we know there's, there's most trouble. We go to the safer areas. So once you've released there, once you feel that softening, then you can move along the um, the rib cage, and then you with the ribs they can be ticklish. So you just start lifting up as you go along, Nissa. So start just behind the shoulder blade, and then and then just push and hold, push and hold, keep holding, and you'll see she's eating. She's quite relaxed, um, and she's going to lean back against you. And then just move along to the next area, push and hold. That's good. She's still nice to pretend. And then move along again. As we get near the pelvis, don't push directly on the bones, but just push on the soft tissues. And you'll see the tail swinging nicely. Um, she's still feeding and her eyes are blinking nice and relaxed. Now, when elephants get nervous, they will often grimace with their mouth and their blinking will often either increase or they'll go into a fixed stare. Just watch the tail. The tail can be the lethal bit with an elephant. Everybody thinks of the trunk, but uh, uh, we all know keepers that have lost teeth to elephants where they've slapped them. Um, she might not like you round the hip at the moment, so in which case we'll come round the other side and this is her, this is where you listen to the patient. So if we come around the other side and then we'll, we'll start again at the, sh at the shoulder. The good thing with elephants is you can move them around. <laughs> so, that's her. so the elephant is now communicating nicely. That little head shake, and that is an acknowledgement that they've heard the command. No, she doesn't want to. <laughs> and she's heard it and is going to ignore us. So if we if we go if we if we go around with the camera, and then we we'll start we we'll start again at the um, at the shoulder. Wonderful. She doesn't want to leave where the food is, I, I expect, and also where she's facing because she can see the other elephants. So again, we go up on the shoulder and then hold. Now, look, you'll see these tissues are much tighter than the other side. So, um, Dr. Nissa, you'll have to stay on this a little bit longer, I'm afraid. Um, John, I'll buy you another drink at the bar later. He's promised me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you'll see... This side is tighter because she's tipping weight from the, the right hind leg onto the left fore. 
the tissues are tighter but less developed. Now, when muscles are really tight for a long period of time, they become more fibrous because the, the body's not going to waste energy holding something tight when it can replace elastic fibres with tight um, uh, um, fibrous tissue and that's what fibrositis is within muscles is this this replacement of elastin tissue with um, more more of the sort of collagen and that um, so we're just pushing up and then holding try and hold for a bit longer if you can I know it's, it's hard work and I know it's a lot hotter there than it is here even though you're cool for Thailand <laughs> You'll see she's just moving. She's probably going to lean in quite hard with this and then working along. And you'll see with her starts in any case, she tends to lean over to the left because she's standing more um, with the left hind leg underneath her. So when you work this side of her, it is always tougher because she will lean further onto you because it allows her to release. When you lift up on the rib cage, you can release the musculature along the top of her spine. And that's really good. Just gently work your way along. That is fantastic. And what I like to see is the elephant just maintain its normal rhythm. So the tail gently swishing, the ears are flapping because they're um, regulating her body temperature so that the, you've got both the veins in the ears and also they create a ripple effect down the flank of the elephant. So it just dissipates heat and helps them maintain a normal body temperature. Now you've seen this has had to move to using her whole forearm and elbow because Pompuy is going to lean much more heavily over this side. She's just using her tail to check where Dr. Nessa is. And, uh, and again, this is just all communication and proprioception. Now, if you move around, don't press directly on the hip joint, but just around it. And then she should lean onto you quite, quite heavily. And she'll fidget to get the right angle. Um, so once she's got the right angle, she'll, um, she'll then push quite hard against you. You might need to come around just slightly more towards the bottom. Um, is that quite heavy? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Get, get, get your shoulder in. That's it. That's the spirit. Um, normally, as I say, we will use we will use two or three people on that area. She just comes slightly further around into her hamstrings, and then she'll um, she should lift up against you, or she should sit back on you rather. And. What's nice with the elephants is they seem to only uh, they only push back as much as you can take. So if we can get four or five people on an area, they will use four or five of you. If there's only one, then they'll use only one. Um, but she she's yeah she she wants you right behind her, Nissa. If you can if you can get behind and then push up against the um, tuberitii. Um, if you can get your shoulder under that, that's the back part of the pelvis. So it's the bit that we sit on, but with them, it's like further back. So it's like their pelvis tips that sort of horizontally. There you go. She's she's enjoying that. There you go. And so this is using using Dr. Nissa as literally a fulcrum that she can push back on. And she's now stretching muscles up around her sacroiliacs and lumbar spine. You haven't really got much room there, have you? Okay. Never work with children or animals. Huh? Then I must go. Yeah, okay. mainly you pushing just... her position for a bit. Yeah, yeah, she's. I see. She goes forward slightly. You okay there, Doctor Nissa? I usually end up treat, <laughs> treating okay. Doctor Nissa when we're when we're there. Oh, good. I'm getting I'm getting thirsty just watching this. <laughs> <laughs> so if you now you should if she should just see she might take a little bit more um from behind because she usually likes quite a good lift from there um if you can come around and film that that'd be brilliant and you'll look at how much she leans back and oh, how she's altered the position of her hind legs so that 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 left hind is much further back now and she's really pushing weight back. And that's allowing not just the muscles around the hips to release, but all up along the where the, the pelvis is and the lumbar spine. That's great. Now, if you come round to that right shoulder, she should let you onto that um, the, the right hip. She should let you onto the right hip now. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> so we always, we always, oh, there you go. We get a nice release there. Um, so if we come round to the right hip, um, she should be more comfortable now having a little bit of work done there. Not always. It depends on the day. Um, but uh, she should now, she's released some of the other stuff, be more willing to have some stuff done. Or maybe not. <laughs> This is what I like with elephants. They they will just tell you what they like and what they don't like. So and that's probably, you know, she's probably saying she's had enough. That's that's brilliant. And that's fine. That's exactly how it goes. Um, and that's about that is about the standard length of treatment for an elephant like her. Um, she's got this long term chronic problem where she can't properly flex that um, right hind. It's both affected the hip and the, the stifle, which in the human is the knee. And we just do what we can as often as we can with her to keep everything else functioning as, as best as we can. Um, she's not a young elephant. She's in her 40s, okay. um, but she's otherwise in really good health. And she's got a fantastic mahout there. Um, he's been an absolute wonder with her and the other elephants he looks after and you've got yourself here a, a really nice comfortable elephant that we just keep keep it, um, working with her to improve and it's great that um, the golden triangulation elephant foundation has this amazing veterinary team embedded as part of of the foundation and they do this work um and they really do turn around some elephants um, that have sort of picked up problems and injuries. And they, they just they do such a fantastic job. Um, so big thank you there to Dr. Nissa. Big thank you to Ooh, who's operating the camera. Um, we'll let you guys um, go. We'll let the elephants go. The elephants are going to go off now and actually enjoy themselves. So they, they go off and... Um, graze in the grasslands and that so we won't hold them up any further um they do they do work a very a very light schedule um it's almost like they're permanently furloughed um but uh, yes so thank you there and we'll come back to i'll see if i can pick up my lecture and uh, um and we will we will come back to the the classroom all right let's see if i can get back in so if we come back in here, um, okay. so this is brilliant. Right. Well, thank you so much for that. That worked. That worked nicely because that is that is a genuine um, speed of a treatment, and what we would sort of expect to be able to to do in a single session. Um, they don't tolerate masses, um, apart from one elephant there who is who is a treatment junkie, um, and uh, she's probably one of the ones that doesn't need that much done to her. Um, but uh, yes, moving on. Um, observation. This is this is key to to what we do. Um, so this was one of the uh, our previous groups that we took out there, um, all before COVID hit. Um, and uh, observing the elephant, looking how they stand. Look at their legs, their ankles, the the, the um, tarsus or ankles in us. How the spine is. So looking along the spine and down the tail, how they hold their head and their trunk. And then we watch them moving and uh, before actually placing hands on. Now, this particular elephant had um, an infection in this leg and you, you probably see that the leg's slightly fatter than you would normally expect. Um, that's not normal, that's because there, there was an infection. So what we wanted to do was um, improve what's called the lymphatic drainage so that the lymphatic system is like the waste disposal circulatory system in the body and that deals with taking away nasties and waste products from from different areas now for some reason the lymphatic system um in all of us as mammals um the the um the vessels themselves are incredibly narrow compared to the blood vessels. And so although an area can swell up very quickly, um, getting it to go down takes longer because the, the, it's, like the, um, it's like the taps are bigger than the plug hole, uh, for want of a better phrase. 
and uh, and so what I wanted to do was devise some lymphatic um, drainage techniques that we could use, um, not just with her. I'll show you another one, and we've got a case study that uh, we have published in in our osteopathic book as well, which was mostly about lymphatic drainage. And in order to do that, what you do is you, you would actually work on the whole elephant to start with before focusing on the limb, because if you've got a drainage problem, you want to make sure that the whole of the, the drainage system is clear before you take the plug out. Um, And then, you know, looking looking at the size of this elephant, this is this is one that I used in my teaser video, which is up on YouTube, um, which was really looking at an elephant that, um, well, you could say physically doesn't have any problems in the, at this stage. I know she's losing weight now, um, but she, when I first met her, she wasn't terribly big, um, but she was so nervous that you couldn't get her to eat if you were anywhere near her. We did a load of treatment and unfortunately it worked too well. And then she she just liked her food too much. So now she's on a diet. But uh, with the lymphatic drainage side, if we can get them laying down, that's fine. If we can't, then we don't. But if we can, then you can you can work all the way through and you can use these springing actions to, to articulate joints and stimulate circulation. Um, all before um, moving on to getting them to then, I'll just go through these, to then work on the limb itself. You'll notice that I've, I've, I've juggling elephants here. I was trying to get pictures that show the actual effect, but this is using the limb to articulate so you can rotate the limb. And if they've hurt the limb, generally they don't want to load bear on it so much. So actually it's it's easier to turn than, than, than um, creating movement in the limb that they are putting weight on. Um, so this was, this was one of the early elephants I worked with, um, if not the first one when I went met John and this had got a uh, puncture injury um, to the left front leg um, just above the elbow and you can see the injury there and um, we developed all these techniques um, with him and uh, he is being fed sunflower seeds as, as he's laying there um, and then he was of a size where whilst he was sidelined, I could pick the leg up and I could rotate it and I could articulate it, oscillate the whole leg. Um, once I got his trust, um, if you just do this to an elephant that doesn't know you, very often you, you take a, sh a short flying lesson. Um, so these are all where we've sort of worked up to these procedures. And, uh, and then... I worked on the premise that with humans and horses and that, there's a passive lymphatic pump with the foot so that when you load bear and press down, it acts as uh, like a plunger effect for the lymphatic system because the lymphatic system is a passive system and it runs alongside um, the venous um, the, uh, system and the, and the blood flow. So the arteries are pumping blood um, oxygenated blood into the tissues and the venous system is taking deoxygenated blood back towards the, the lungs to be oxygenated and the lymphatic system piggybacks on that in order to pull waste products up and then they're, they're taken out of the body via things such as the liver and the kidneys um, and I thought well Elephants have this amazing cushion in their foot because they stand up on their fingertips and toes, and then they've got this massive cushion behind. Um, I thought, let's see if we can work with, with that and, and pump with that. So that's exactly what we did. Um, and I just pumped away um, on the foot. And then later on, you can work with the elephant standing and you can do this oscillating effect where you you rotate the limb and the more relaxation you get in the muscles the easier it is for that pump system that, and that passive piggyback system to work and, and for excess tissue fluid to be taken out of the tissues into the lymphatic system and back up and then either recycled or excreted out of the body 
and you can just work on the on the rotation and getting that and then rotating one way so you can you can work on one way and then work on another way and that way you're loosening all the musculature right up in, in with the front limb you're, you're working right up around the shoulder blades and all those what we call periscapular muscle muscles but also the chest muscles so the more you open those up you're not just improving lymphatic drainage you're actually taking tension out of the chest and the front limbs are attached to the chest by purely by a muscle sling over the top and underneath and so that way you can allow the 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 rib cage to move more easily and therefore breathing becomes easier i've already mentioned that elephants don't have a pleural membrane and uh, and so you you take away any constriction to the lungs themselves and therefore you've got the lungs are around the heart so you take pressure off the heart so but just by doing this you can actually take a lot of stress out of uh, an individual's body now i started off with the first elephant and the youngest well one of the youngest not the youngest i've, I've worked with them when they're sort of literally just days old um especially in africa where they've, they've had infections of like pneumonia and that because they've lost their mums and uh, they they don't have the warmth for their mothers and so um pneumonia is a biggie with with elephant calves um certainly in countries where it's hot during the day and then really cold at night um, such as a lot of the the um, african territories um, and this is back to longley with our oldest elephant um Anne. Um, she's um, originally from Sri Lanka and uh, I'm working with her. Now you'll see she's got um, in this picture, you'll see a blue bucket and there's a saline solution in there because at the time of that treatment, we were treating her for um, an, uh, just a, a mild um, infection in the foot, um, which I'm happy to say is all cleared up and, and uh, doing fine. Um, but just to show you the techniques that Dr. Nissa was doing on Pumpui. I'm using here on Anne um, because she is arthritic and she's slightly more arthritic in one hip than the other. And so she tips her weight um, more onto um, the, the opposite diagonal on the front end. And, uh, and so, yes, we come full circle from sort of one of the youngest to um, certainly probably the oldest one I'm likely to treat for a while. Um, and I'm part of an amazing team at Longleat where we look after Anne and uh, she's an ex-circus elephant for anyone around the world who doesn't know. Um, she was the last circus elephant in the UK and uh, she's now very much enjoying a life of retirement. Um, and a lot of a lot of people say she enjoyed her time a lot of her time in the circus because she did get to travel a lot she swam in the sea she did all sorts of things um whilst traveling around and possibly that's helped her live a long life who knows um, but she is a very contented happy elephant um and uh, she's been another great classroom because again treating the geriatric elephant as opposed to the younger elephants you know, you know they're very much like people um you know she's she can be like your grumpy grandmother um in that you know if she's not having a good day she will let you know um, when you're working with some of the younger elephants they're often cheeky and they mess about and they they do silly things um all of the time we're we're sort of working on the personality of the elephant what they will accept and how we can maximize any um, work that we're doing with them but we have achieved uh, in my mind i achieved the impossible because when i started working with uh, mimbu um, it was a little bit of a setup uh, in that the vet knew that there was a, a film crew wanted to film a news item and he thought it'd be really funny if they gave me this elephant to treat live on camera um, to, for me to make a fool of myself. Um, I should say we became very close friends um, and we still are very close friends. Um, he got a wicked sense of humour, uh, but he was a fantastic zoo vet. He's now retired um, and he taught me absolutely loads, uh, one of which was don't assume you can't do something, you know, just because nobody's done it before. Um, and yes, nearly 30 years later, here we are um, 
now with the technology embracing right across the globe uh, work that we're continuing remotely until we can get back out there. Um, so thank you very much uh, for listening. It's been a great pleasure to be invited back. I think the work that John and Nissa and you are doing is phenomenal. Um, what you see at the Golden Triangle Asian Elephant Foundation is the tip of the iceberg of the work that they do. They are absolutely amazing and, and fantastic support for elephants, both um, elephants that are owned and elephant conservation um, and um, actually wildlife conservation worldwide really with John um, so thank you so much if you want to know anything more about what we do um, you can go to the website a um, little plug for the book there is um, there is a case history in here um, I did mark the page um, with the elephant where we were doing the lymphatic drainage in chapter 10 um john's book that well there it is john you can see your book <laughs> i'll be delivering it when i can come out there um so yeah thank you so much it's been a real pleasure to come back and talk to everyone and if there are, are any questions if anybody would like to ask questions i would happily answer them thank you very much thank you very much tony um Looking through the looking through the Facebook, I don't see any questions. Um, there's, there's a lot of respect for you, and thank you very much, you know, Darren. Respect for everybody and great great work. Uh, Nisa Anu, do you have any questions? Are you still there? I think we've worn Nisa out. <laughs> I think we have. Yeah, she's probably, she's probably retired to her to her room and some shade for a for a cool drink of water or something. Bless, so, yeah. Tony, thank you. That just remains, I think, for me to say thank you very much. Fantastic talk, second time around, and we uh, a little bit of hiccup in the beginning. So thank you for bearing with us the, the dodgy internet and things like that. Um, thank you also for for talking us through a uh, through a treatment, which was great to, to to show the world actually what you do. It's the the only one so far, I think, that we've had a that we've had these these live elephants on as well for an elephant profession. So we should try oh, and do that similar later. Um, yeah, and see you very soon. We hope. Um, quite. I, I do hope so. Yeah, I don't know, but we're. Um, it looks as though looks as though things are opening up a little bit. So with with any luck, we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to to get you and the team out here from from somewhere. Yeah, no, brilliant. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much for allowing me to come back. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, John. Okay, so and that's it. I think Take for it. next week we are into the realms of science and elephant behavior and elephant cooperation. Uh, Dr. Lili from Sichuan Bana Tropical Botanical Gardens talking about elephants that she studied in Myanmar and the uh, the limits of cooperation with elephants when you try and ask them to to share food and to work together to share food. And uh, she was very some some deeper science going on there. Um, no, not deeper science, but more academic, I think, than, than, than hands-on. I don't think we're going to do some hands-on stuff, but there will be some videos and things of elephants cooperating and not cooperating in, in Myanmar with each other, not with their osteopath. Um, so, yep, that's it. And uh, thank you very much. See you all next week. I, there, it will be a lockdown live stream, I think, at 4 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. There won't be one at 10.30 because we, we have something has come up and we have to go and do other things. So we're getting busy, busy, busy here. Um, we will see everybody at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Until then, have a good day and uh, enjoy yourselves. Yep. Cool. That was good. Okay, good. You st you're still on. Um, I had a nice meeting with um, Darren at Longleat yesterday. Hold on a second. Hold on a second.